wasn't able to be with us today, but I want to thank him uh, for his work on this issue. Introduction 862, sponsored by Councilmember Paul Vallone, would amend the administrative code of the City of New York to allow the Department of Buildings to issue stop work orders whenever a notice to revoke a work permit is issued, and I will invite Councilmember Vallone up to speak on this. Thank you to our leader, our speaker, and thank you everyone. Uh, today I'm proud to speak on intro 862. Too often we are left to watch construction sites continue their destructive or illegal work even after a building department inspector has visited the site. Issuing additional violations or a notice to revoke the existing permits is simply not enough. Current practice allows unscrupulous developers and builders to simply continue their destructive or illegal work for weeks even after these measures are used. Today's bill will close that loophole and allow inspectors, when warranted, to issue an immediate stop work order. Whether it is a residential or commercial site, we will now be able to promote safety at construction sites and ensure that all work immediately ceases when there is clear evidence there are violations of our building codes. Thank you and everyone who made this possible, including Jason Goldman, Laura Papa, Janine Zikou, Austin Bradford, and my staff, and our speaker, as always, for their efforts in bringing this bill to the floor today. I urge my colleagues to vote aye today. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, we're going to vote on two bills sponsored by Councilmember Costa Constantinides, the chair of our Ma Environmental Protection Committee. Introduction 425 would require the commissioner of uh, DEP to submit a plan to prevent sewer backups to the mayor and to the council and to post that plan on DEP's website by uh, December 31st of this year, 2019. And the next bill is introduction 424, which would amend Title 24 of the Administrative Code of the City of New York by adding a new section, that section is 24-503.1, to require the maintenance measures needed to assure that sewage backups occur no more frequently than 50, uh, 1%, uh, 50 per 100 miles of sewer line. I want to invite uh, Costa up to speak on that. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, and thank you for your strong advocacy and, and fighting to make sure we keep our neighborhoods clean. Uh, you know, these two bills uh, really help homeowners who, you know, you deal with one sewer backup, you deal with another, and then you say it's fixed, and then you deal with another, and then they say it's fixed, and you deal with another. Your, 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 your basements get flooded, your homes get flooded, your life is destroyed over and over again, and you keep getting assurances it's not going to happen again, but it keeps happening. Uh, so intro 424 requires the Department of Environmental Protection to respond to sewer backups within 10 calendar days of when it's confirmed. And intro 425 requires the agency to come up with a strategy to identify and prevent sewer backups, especially chronic issues in flood-prone areas. While grease, fats, oils are the leading cause, creating those disgusting fatbergs, which we've seen, which are pretty gross, uh, we can't stop looking at them online, actually. <laughs> <laughs> this bill will ensure that DEP consider the impacts of roots the creeping their way into our sewer system. Plant roots are a serious threat to these areas, as well as those with high water tables. Uh, backups aren't stinky and unpleasant. They spew toxins into our streets, homes and businesses, all sorts of dis disgusting stuff, which I won't talk about. And this happens too often disproportionately in particular neighborhoods, like Southeast Queens, uh, Community Board 12, and the North Shore of Staten Island. Uh, the pass of these bills would bring us to compliance with the EPA, and I want to thank the Council uh, for supporting these legislations. Thanks. Thanks, Costa. Introduction uh, 268, sponsored by another bill by Councilor Richards, would repeal Section 24-323.1D of the Administrative Code of the City of New York and replace it with a new provision that would require the Department of Environmental Protection to report annually on several conditions related to the proper installation and testing of backflow prevention devices. Councilor Richards isn't able to be here today, but I want to thank him for these two bills. Introduction 353, sponsored by Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, would require the Department of Buildings to provide a service whereby users of its website could sign up to receive email updates whenever a change in status is recorded on selected construction projects. And I want to invite Helen up to speak thank on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Speaker Johnson. I am pleased that the Council will be voting today on my legislation which creates an email alert system for New York City residents, notifying them about any change in the status of a construction permit, particularly a stop work order. New Yorkers 
we be able to sign up with the Department of Buildings and get email updates on multiple construction projects. So um, let's just to piggyback on to what Councilmember Vallone was saying. Now with his legislation, a stop work order can be put on immediately. If you are somebody who lives in the area and you want to keep tabs on the building construction that's going on in your area, you will receive an email notice that moment saying that a stop work order has been placed. You live in the area and you hear five hours later the construction is continuing. You can use at that moment the fact that you have the knowledge that a stop work order was placed on it, you can call, well, I would recommend you call the Office of the Tenant Advocate in the Department of Buildings and make sure that the Department of Buildings is alerted about unscrupulous activity immediately. Um, <clears throat> I just, I just want to stress that the importance uh, uh, about the importance of this legislation. If we don't get the word out about it, no one will know about it. It's not like building owners are going to put up on their, you know, work order permit, you know, and sign up to get email alerts in case we're not following the rules. <laughs> Feel new legislation coming on. Yeah. Go for it. Um, but, you know, we always are trying to find one way to, to find a step ahead of the developers who are using construction as harassment. And this is one way of doing that. But people won't know about it unless we get, unless we get the word out about this. And um, I'm just so grateful to uh, my housing director, Ana Gago, uh, who, who thought of this idea. Um, and to Speaker Johnson, who made sure that the council wrote it correctly and uh, is going to get it passed today. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, finally, uh, we are going, I want to thank the great staff who worked on the bill as well who are here. Finally, we're going to vote on a package of three bills, very important bills, uh, aimed at protecting workers in the private carding industry. Uh, individuals employed in this industry work, industry work hard to perform an essential service every night and during the day under potentially dangerous conditions and we need to make sure that they are being treated fairly. I'm committed to reforming the trade waste, trade waste industry to make it safer for employees and the public, to support good unions who have workers' best interests in mind, and re to reduce the environmental burden to trade waste truck traffic. So I'm really excited that today we're passing three bills. Uh, two of the bills are by Councilmember Reynoso, the chair of our sanitation committee, and one bill is by Councilmember Amoya, and this will improve the carding industry. Uh, the first two bills, again, by our sanitation chair, introduction 1329, would mandate that the Business Integrity Commission, BIC, will establish standards for the registration of labor unions in the trade waste industry and authorize BIC to disqualify union agents and officers who have tied to organize, who have ties to organized crime. And the second bill is introduction 1373 and it would require BIC to refer labor and wage violation cases involving private carters to the New York State Attorney General and the United States Department of Labor and other relevant city, state, and federal law enforcement agencies uh, Chair Reynoso has been leading on this for a very long time. He was really ahead of the curve on seeing the issues that came out through Kira Feldman's amazing reporting, uh, through ProPublica on sanitation salvage and the workers who were killed, uh, the number of people who were exploited. He stood with workers. He stood in front of BIC. He has been relentless on this issue. He's worked on these bills for a very long time, and this is going to be very, very important to protect workers in this industry. So I'm really proud of him, and I want to invite him up to speak on these bills. Thank you. Just want to thank uh, Speaker Johnson again. A lot of the progress that I've made has really come under his leadership, um, being empowered to finally start addressing these issues <clears throat> in the private sanitation industry. Um, today we're going to pass the three bills aimed at removing what I call sham unions from the private carding industry, <laughs> educating workers on their right to organize, and codifying the steps the city must take when they suspect the waste step is occurring in a private carding company. As you have heard me state many times before, the private sanitation industry operates without regard for the health and safety of its workers 
uh, or the city at large. Routes are inefficient, safety standards are poor, and environmentally sustainable practices are non-existent in many of these companies. However, it is the treatment of workers, many of whom are immigrants or formerly incarcerated individuals, uh, some of the most vulnerable members of our society that I find most tragic. But I wanna be clear, it is not only the companies themselves that are complicit in this disgraceful behavior. In many of these shops, it is the very unions that are supposed to represent and protect these workers who are aiding and abetting their mistreatment. It is important for me to clarify exactly what type of union we're talking about here. These are not unions like the Teamsters, DC 37 or 1199. Organizations that have a long history of fighting for their members and delivering meaningful benefits to workers. What we are talking about today are sham unions, organizations that are in collusion with company ownership to prevent legitimate unions from organizing workers and ensure these workers never receive meaningful benefits and protections for their employees, from their employees. Sham unions have also used a, uh, sham unions have also been used as a vehicle uh, for organized crime to retain a foothold within the carding industry. BIC's oversight authority only extends to companies themselves, not the officers of these sham unions. This gap in BIC's authority has allowed organized crime to continue working within the carding industry. One of the pieces of legislation into 1329 would expand BIC's authority, giving them the necessary tools to investigate union officers within the commercial waste industry. We will also be passing two other bills sponsored by myself and Councilmember Moya that will further codify BIC's oversight and workers' rights to organize. I wanna thank the Teamsters for first bringing the existence of sham unions to my attention and Kira Feldman from ProPublica for her reporting on the connections these unions have to organized crime. I also wanna thank the Transform the Trash Coalition for the continued efforts to fight for reform. And finally, I wanna thank Speaker Corey Johnson for his unwavering commitment to ensuring that the status quo in the private carding industry becomes a thing of the past. I also wanna thank Nicole and Laura Popa from uh, uh, the Speaker's office who have been instrumental in helping me push this and really making sure that uh, legally it's something that we can do. So thank you. Thanks. You worked really hard on this. Congratulations. Thank you, brother. Appreciate Congratulations. it. Uh, and lastly, uh, introduction 1368, sponsored by Councilmember Francisco Moya, who will require the Business Integrity Commission BIC to provide information about workers' rights on their website and mandate that private carters registered by BIC provide information directly to their employees. That is it on today's stated agenda. I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. And I'm happy to take on topic questions first. Katie. They do, um, but this is they were, you know, EPA had found um, some deficiencies in that, so this helps codify uh, the, the, the order that they're working on. Do you know some of what those deficiencies were? I can get those back to you, okay. definitely. Anything else on topic? Henry. Question for Council Member Rosenthal. Yes. Why isn't there a notice provision in this legislation? What do you mean, a notice provision? Why isn't there a, a provision in the law that requires uh, the building permit notice to say uh, gotcha. Yeah. First of all, because I didn't think of it until <laughs> I was standing right here. Yeah, I agree. But on and and off the top of my head, um, well, anyone is welcome to submit the idea very quickly. Um, you know. Uh, I mean, we should definitely try. They, the Department of Buildings feels strongly that the work permit itself is already very crowded. And I had to, you know, the real estate, the space on the work permit itself. Um, and one thing that I fought very hard for, but finally did win, was requiring that they put um, whether or not the building was occupied on the work permit itself because oftentimes they would neglect to mention the fact that despite the fact they were doing a gut renovation, there were still people living in the building. Um, but that was a real fight to get the space to do that. But by now, someone has submitted a request for legislation no, to do exactly <laughs> that. Thank you Any other for validating on-topic questions? We'll mm -hmm. go off topic? Okay, off topic, Gloria. Yes. Um, just because these are going a little bit more into what you, uh, how you think the plan can get forth and what you can do in, uh, in order to oppose it or improve it or change it, do you have any ideas how to do that? Well, I strongly support congestion pricing. I always have, so I'm glad to see that the 
the mayor is now on board. I think the proposal that was outlined earlier this week is short on details, and details really matter here uh, for this plan. One thing that is clear from the plan is that it would give the state greater authority over uh, the streets of New York City on where the transponders would be located below 61st Street. It would create an unnamed committee to decide what the pricing should be on that. It would create, uh, it would give greater authority to New York State on how potential revenue is spent. And so this plan needs to be a plan that has dedicated revenue to New York City transit, to our subways and buses, and to transit deserts in places like Paul Vallone's district where they don't have subway service in the way that they need. None of that is fleshed out in this plan. It is some guiding principles without real details. I think the city needs greater home rule authority, not giving our authority away. We should be taking more control, especially when it is something that affects city streets and affects the day-to-day -day revenue and operations uh, of New York City Transit, of the MTA, of our subways and buses. So I think this plan falls short on that. Uh, I'm surprised the mayor would sign on uh, to the plan uh, without having a greater level of commitment on how the money was gonna be spent. And um, I'm gonna have things to say in greater detail on Tuesday at uh, my State of the City on uh, the subways and the buses and on congestion pricing in a very detailed way. Can I have a follow-up? Yeah. On your point about home rule, the last time I think they tried to do congestion pricing, the council had to pass a home rule uh, measure before uh, all Albany could take it up. Do we have to do that again this time around? I don't know if we have to do it, but I think that is likely the right thing to do. Um, we haven't had an internal conversation here at the council because one of the, I think, problems here is that in 2007, I believe, when the council voted on that home rule message under former Mayor Bloomberg and former Speaker Quinn, there was a, there was a city proposal that the city kind of brought to Albany and the council voted on that. We don't have a real proposal here. We've had two competing panels, or not panels, proposals. The first was the Move to New York one, which I think is a better proposal, which lowers the tolls on the Outer Bridge crossings, the Throgs Neck, the Veranzano, the Whitestone, uh, to create some greater equity. And then you had the Fix New York panel, which was a panel by the governor about a year and a half ago, which doesn't do that. I think the Move to New York plan is a better plan. It's a more fulsome plan. It's a more detailed plan. And so one of the issues that we have is, what do we vote on? We don't have a real plan. So we are looking at potentially what a plan should look like, uh, but we're still in the process of doing that. But I'm going to have some um, greater detail to fill in on Tuesday at my State of the City. Rich? I think Amanda Eisenberg did uh, really great reporting uh, on this, um, and uh, I learned a lot uh, just from reading her long piece yesterday uh, on the plan and on the hearing that took place. Helping New Yorkers deal with mental illness and mental health problems is a laudable goal, but we have to make sure we're investing wisely and operating efficiently in service to that cause. I want to you know, thank the First Lady, who I think <coughs> has done a great job in actually bringing this issue greater to the forefront and destigmatizing, talking about mental health issues and mental illness and getting people the help that they need. But given the, the size of it, you know, we have to make sure that those dollars are being spent wisely, and that's why it was important to have that hearing yesterday. But do you think that the <coughs> was added to the cost? I don't know enough. I think there were unanswered questions yesterday um, again, it's a, it's a plan that involves many, many agencies. It's a plan that I know the First Lady has proudly <coughs> taken across the country uh, to speak about what other municipalities and states should be looking at. Um, I don't know all of the details. Uh, again, I learned a lot from Amanda Eisenberg's reporting yesterday, and the council will continue to take a look at it. Yes, sir. What's your name? Yes. Yeah. Oh, hi, Joe. It's you. Welcome. It's Good to see you. It's me. Um, so it's part of the remand bill that we need to have the doctor's name for all these data that's in here. And the next point is the bid process. I'm wondering if you plan to bring it to the council. So 
Uh, it's going through the legislative process. I know that it was a hearing that was pretty emotional for folks that came and testified um, who had really been, uh, you know, abused in some way. And so I, I have full confidence in Councilmember Levine. I think he did a great job at that hearing and we're continuing to work internally on it. Jill? Uh, budget and hearings will likely start next week. Yes, right? yes. What do you, I guess, can you give us a sense of your sort of top line concerns about the city budget obviously will start in the week, next week, but you know, what are you looking to come out of this uh, first round of hearings? Well, there was a significant drop in December and in January on, uh, on taxes, uh, personal income taxes, which affected the amount of revenue that was coming in. The controller, I believe, had a report either earlier this week or last week that showed actually after that more money had come in, so we started to go uh, in an upward way, which is a good thing. The city budget's growing. It looks like almost $3 billion from the previous fiscal year, so the budget's growing quite a bit. A big cost associated with it are the labor contracts that were renegotiated by the mayor, which eats up a lot of that. New spending in the preliminary plan is I think just around $300 million, which is not a lot of new spending uh, that the mayor announced. One of the things that I have the biggest concerns about is the uh, modified PEG, the program to eliminate the gap, related to $750 million in uh, savings. I am totally fine with finding savings, and if you look at last year's uh, council response in the preliminary budget or, or on uh, throughout the entire budget process, we identified hundreds of millions of dollars in savings that we, could, we thought could happen through efficiencies, not through cutting social services. So I am really concerned that I, I do not want this administration cutting social service programs. I don't want them cutting youth programs. I don't want them cutting programs uh, related to, to health, uh, so we're going to be very vigilant about that going through this process. The hearing on Wednesday, our first budget hearing of the primary budget with OMB and Director Hartzog is going to be a very important hearing to talk about the contours and the outlines of the budget. Every year, the Council Finance Division does an enormous amount of work looking at the trends and forecasting over the course of the budget. We don't always agree with OMB and their projections, and IBO, the Independent Budget Office, doesn't typically agree with both of us. And so you have to look at different numbers here to figure out how to sort through it. We want to continue, at least I want to continue, to strengthen the social safety net in New York City, not cut away uh, at services for the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Rich. So uh, in the congestion pricing deal, again, just got set back to back. Yep. No. Okay. <laughs> what, what, what's your objection? There are, again, I'm going to speak in very granular detail on Tuesday at my State of the City on how I believe we can transform the MTA, how congestion pricing fits into that. Uh, I've been out there talking about municipal control, and we're going to lay out the case in a very detailed way on why municipal control makes sense. I don't think municipal control is happening anytime soon, not this legislative session, but I think it's important to set the stage and talk about uh, why the MTA is basically a bureaucratic Frankenstein right now uh, and why we need to change things. On congestion pricing, again, there have been competing proposals. I think the Move New York proposal is a better proposal. If you're going to have congestion pricing, which I support, it's, it's not fair for a council member of Valone's constituents who take the Whitestone Bridge to not get a discount on that bridge uh, if you're going to create the congestion fee coming into Manhattan. So I think there's a way to do it in an equitable way and to hopefully gain support in the outer boroughs from council members and assembly members and state senators. This, this what was announced uh, earlier this week, gives the state more authority. One of the biggest problems is that New York City needs more home rule authority on how we deal with subways and buses and congestion pricing and regulating our streets. This comes down to home rule authority. I wish we had more home rule authority on taxes. We don't. We really only have it in a small way on property taxes, but we don't have it on income taxes. We don't have it on uh, all the other taxes that affect us. So it is a much bigger uh, question here, and I'm 
surprised that the that the mayor signed on uh, to this, given that there are so many details that are still left up in the air and that we really need to know the answers to. Gloria? I hope it doesn't fail. Uh, this is really about political leadership, and I'm really glad that the governor, uh, even though I don't agree with this exact plan, I'm glad the governor has really prioritized this in saying that this needs to happen either for the April 1st budget or before the end of the legislative session in June. Um, I have spoken to Speaker Hasty, who I have a great relationship with and I think has done a really good job in looking out for the city uh, in the past. The last time I spoke to him was uh, a couple of weeks ago when I was in Albany for the joint uh, committee of the Assembly Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee testifying on the state budget. And at that time when I met with him, I discussed the concerns I had on the initial uh, congestion pricing plan that was put in the governor's uh, budget, uh, his first budget uh, announcement on this in January. I let him know the concerns that I had and he said it would go through a process. I think one of the problems here is a lot of folks have been skeptical about this in the outer boroughs, uh, in the Bronx and in Brooklyn and in Queens and Staten Island because there haven't been details associated with it. You need real details. Are you gonna create more express bus lines in areas that don't have subway service? Are you gonna invest in greater infrastructure? Are you going to do all these things that are necessary? I think it's important to put the congestion pricing money in a lockbox that goes to subways, buses, and transit deserts. That's what needs to happen. There has been no detailed plan outlining what that would be. So it's hard for legislators who are in transit starved areas to commit to something if they don't know if that money is actually gonna go to help their constituents. Anyone else? Yes. what could happen is give municipal control of the subways and buses to the city of New York so you don't have a 17 member unaccountable board that is making decisions on this. That's ultimately what can happen. Right now, our hands are tied. The fares are officially going up, uh, uh, you know, and, and I think um, the fares are going up while well, at the exact same time we don't have a commitment on funding fast forward. We don't have a commitment on new revenue streams being created. We don't have a commitment on a long-term plan uh, to fund the current issues at the MTA and the future issues related to fast forward. I think Andy Byford is doing a tremendous job. I have the utmost faith in him. I think he has a huge amount of credibility with riders in New York City and I think he's been a real leader in actually crafting a plan um, you know, one of the issues around the fare increase is that if you put the fare increase off, you'd, co you'd be costing the MTA about $30 million a month when the MTA already is in the hole quite a bit. So, you know, this is why we need to have a conversation about the future of the MTA so you don't get in these situations where you're up against a wall having to make these bad decisions on a fare increase uh, because we haven't figured out the governance issues, we haven't figured out the revenue issues, we haven't figured out the capital plan issues. Right now it's a five-year capital plan, I think it should be a 10-year capital plan. There are all these issues that are associated with it, so you're making these decisions in a vacuum without looking at the wider field of what needs to happen here. Katie? Uh, I guess to um, follow up on that, um, you know, obviously you're a big proponent of fair fares. Do you have an update? I know uh, at the budget hearing, it seemed like the mayor said by the end of February he would have updated numbers on signups, and it was February 28th. You know, um, do you have any ideas of that? We're going to have, I think, some good announcement soon Please. on really good, I think, progress on fair fares. Um, progress that I think should have happened a while ago, but progress that is happening now in a day-to-day, -day, very detailed way. So I've been updated uh, this week on some of that progress. We're not ready to announce it 
not because you know we're trying to obscure where we are, but there are actually a lot of details to be worked out um, on how you get the card to people and on the the, the folks that would qualify for it uh, and how they how they get a hold of it. There are lots of details we worked out. I think there'll be an announcement very soon on it, and I'm really happy with the progress we've made in the last six weeks on this, where there has been um, a lot of day-to-day -day work and conversation that's happened. I especially want to thank Commissioner Banks uh, from HRA, who has spent an enormous amount of time on this over the last two months, and I think uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks we're going to have some more detailed information to give on where we are in fair fares. I don't have the exact number, but I, but I, but it's not even just about the number of people that have signed up. I mean that that's important, but it's really about how we make sure that anyone who wants to sign up can sign up by getting that infrastructure in place and having a real time frame on how to do that, which is what I have been working towards internally. So it's not a fit and a start, but actually there is a plan that needs to be abided by on how anyone who qualifies can sign up for it, and that's what I've been pushing for. Henry. Just one question. You are a lawmaker. You're a legislator. The mayor and the governor have agreed the concept of our congestion pricing. I, I don't know what that. Details that haven't been I don't know what that concept is. Happened. Yeah, because no details. But why don't you have confidence in the state legislature to listen to your uh, concerns, to listen to the concerns of the people in the street brands associations, et cetera, et cetera and come up with the plan that will fill out the concept. I mean, isn't this really what the legislative process should be? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. The question is, why do you expect the mayor and governor to lay out an entire detailed matrix of a plan when the mayor has been quite clear in saying, I, we've agreed on a concept, and now it's up to the legislative process to come up with all of the details to take into consideration all of the concerns, some of which you've mentioned, and come up with a, I hate to use the word scheme, but a, but a plan, a policy, a, uh, basically to fill in all of the various concerns, some of which you've raised today. I, maybe I wasn't uh, totally clear before. I'm not sure this is totally binary, but what I mean by that is through any legislative process, there'll be negotiations, there'll be modifications, there'll be changes that are made depending on what the state legislature feels is important to the members of that body, and, and I'm okay with that. I, we do the here at, that here at the city council. There's always compromise that happens depending on what the needs are and what the opinions are of the folks that are here, so that's a normal thing that will happen. But I think the way we are starting right now is this has been talked about through multiple panels, through the Move New York plan, through the Fix New York panel, through creating a new panel, supposedly, to set the prices of what the number is going to be by December of 2020. This has been talked about since 2007. We are 12 years later. We should be beyond concept. We should be down to brass tacks. And then, if it needs to be negotiated further through the State Senate and through the State Assembly, that's totally fine. That's normal. That will happen. But what was announced earlier this week wasn't that. It was kicking the can down the road to, again, another unaccountable, unnamed panel that will eventually set the prices. It didn't talk about putting that money in a lockbox just for projects in New York City and for transit deserts. It talked about the state having greater control of our streets. Those are all things that I think are unacceptable. And I think we need greater clarity on that and we need leadership on that from uh, folks here in the city. I've been talking about this nonstop during my time as speaker and before I was speaker and before I was elected to the council when I was on the local community board in Chelsea and Hell's Kitchen. So. I, I don't think we are at a point where we're going to have all of the answers, but I think it needs to be beyond concept at this point and actually talking about greater details. I, I don't want to get into a back and forth here. We can get into a back and forth. I think the mayor was quite clear in saying that the... The mayor likes this. I, I, saying that he insisted that the revenue would be put in a so-called lockbox for, you know, and to, to, to match transit. 
Well, the mayor the didn't. Was I could be wrong on this. I could be wrong on this. I think that when the mayor was asked when he testified in front of the Joint Committee of the Assembly Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee, and he was asked about that, he was open to some of the money going to Long Island. That was, that I'm not, I, well, that was, that was two weeks ago. I know, but I'm talking about what he said yesterday. And beyond that, you know, what is he going to say bridges, in two weeks? He has, you know, part of his plan is that if you take a bridge, that there will be some kind of discount. It will be, quote, taken into account in how much the money is, is going to pay to enter Manhattan, whether that's a full, you know, one for one or a full discount. Or I'm telling you, Henry, I, I support the Move New York plan. So I support the Move New York plan. I think that plan's better than the Fix NY plan and better than what was announced earlier this week with greater detail. The Move New York plan is really based off of the 2007 proposal with some updated changes along the way as things have changed over the last decade. That's where I am. Again, it's not up to me. Uh, but I think it's important that uh, we hear multiple voices in this process who want greater clarity and greater detail, not just because it affects the streets of New York City, but it ultimately is going to affect the way people get around every single day on subways and buses, given that we're going to rely upon this revenue for fast forward and for MT operating funds. Okay. I mean, the basic thrust of my question is, you're a lawmaker, you're a legislator, Mayor and Governor have come up with the outline of a plan. You can debate what, how specific it is or whether it's specific or not. But why don't you have confidence in the legislative process? I didn't say I didn't. To come up with a plan that will, will take into account all of these various I didn't say I didn't have confidence. I've had multiple conversations with Speaker Hasty and with Majority Leader Stuart Cousins about the concerns that I had about what was proposed initially in January as part of the state budget being <coughs> unveiled and the language that was in the state budget. I talked about the concerns that I had. They very understandably said they have to work within their conference. So I, I haven't said I don't have confidence in them. I'm glad I have an open line of communication with them <coughs> to continue to talk about the deficiencies that I see and the things that are important to include in all of this. And what ultimately I want is congestion pricing to pass in the best way possible for reducing congestion on the streets of Manhattan, gaining greater revenue for the MTA in New York City Transit, and uh, hopefully doing something environmentally friendly for the city of New York. So that's, those are sort of my guiding principles, and I haven't said I don't have confidence. I have a great working relationship, and they have things that they have to balance inside of their conference. Their conferences are, well, at least the Assembly's conference is much bigger than the City Council, so I know it's even harder for Speaker Hasty to be able to balance these things, and I don't envy that position that he's in. But he, I want to give him credit because he has been a longtime supporter. I think he has supported congestion pricing since 2007. He was one of the earliest supporters in the Assembly in the outer boroughs. So I, I haven't said I don't have confidence in them. Summer. Mayor and Governor are united. I know, but I mean, for how long? <laughs> I mean, if I had the answer to that question, um, I uh, speak to the governor. Uh, the governor called me earlier this week, and um, we talked briefly about congestion pricing. Uh, we didn't get into all the details related to it. Um, I thanked him for prioritizing it and pushing for it. Um, they know the concerns that I have related to the details associated with the plan. Again, it's something, as I just answered Henry, that the state legislature is going to work through. I'm going to continue to talk about the deficiencies that I see and the improvements that could be made. Um, but, you know, I, I, whenever the governor calls me, I take his phone call. So I'll continue to talk with him. And when I call him, he usually takes my phone call. Joe? I'll come back, Summer. Joe? Well, 
our uh, a great group of council members here, including Councilmember Reynoso, uh, worked really hard on coming up with recommendations uh, on the land use process and potential changes that should be sought. I'm happy to have him speak about what his opinion is on that because he spent an enormous amount of time uh, working on that. I wasn't part of all those conversations. The council put forward a document about three weeks ago, I think it was 50 pages long, uh, outlining all sorts of reforms, not just on land use, but on procurement, which Councilman Rosenthal has been a real leader on, and the issues at OMB with units of appropriation. So we have a very detailed document. It's on our website. Uh, again, I can't say that I support every single one of those things. I haven't had a chance to go through and uh, look in a very granular way at all of the things. We tried to have a consensus document that all the folks would feel comfortable with, um, and I wanted to make sure that the council members here had a level of freedom in getting things that were important to them inside of that document to be part of the conversation for the Charter Revision Commission. The commission continues to have meetings. They had a meeting earlier this week, I think it was two nights ago, on election reform, talking about ranked choice voting and other election reforms putting forward. I don't think they've had the second land use meeting yet, which will happen, I think, in the next few weeks. Um, and so uh, we're 30 years uh, after the 1989 Charter Revision Commission, which created a 51-member city council after the Board of Estimate was ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. After 30 years, I think it's time for a fresh look at the entire charter. The almost dozen other Charter Revision Commissions that have met since 1989 have all done things in a very piecemeal way that didn't take a broad look at the entire charter. This charter commission was charged with the mandate of looking at the entire city charter. Land use, elections, the budget process, uh, advise and consent, all of these things which no one has looked at really in a full way for the last 30 years. They're doing that work. I haven't interfered in the work. I haven't told them what they should put on the ballot. I haven't, I, I've, I've had very few conversations with them because I want them to really um, come up with recommendations on their own. They put it forward, as you know, an initial proposal. I think it was on five issue areas that they wanted to look at. Land use was one of those. But I want Councilmember Rosenth uh, Council Reynoso to talk about the land use portion if he wants to, because he worked very hard on that. Um, I'll just, I'll be gen as general as possible so, so we don't stand here forever. Um, uh, what we're looking for is a comprehensive plan. Uh, I think there's a disconnect right now with many communities as to what role they play in the greater, the bigger picture about what New York City is going to look like and what every community should be contributing. Um, we have a lot of brown and black communities, poor communities that are being rezoned, um, that uh, feel that the burden of building all the affordable housing and all these changes are falling upon them. Um, if there was a comprehensive plan done by the city, they would also know what other uh, communities would be contributing um, and uh, could speak to equity as well related to homeless shelters, waste transfer stations, which, I, which I've been fighting for a long time. Um, once the entire city knows what their role is going to be in how they're going to build it out, um, I think that the communities um, might not be up in arms uh, every single time we have a rezoning and also just allowing for the process in the beginning to have more community input um, before uh, applications get certified by DCP. I think would also allow for communities, again, to feel their voices are being heard. So those are the intentions and the foundation by which we're building. So we're hoping that uh, in the future, uh, people would vote uh, for a comprehensive plan and for more access to communities to have a voice. And, and we don't even know if the Charter Revision Commission is gonna put these on the ballot. No, not yet. But it was a proposal that we put forward to at least have them look at it and think about it and discuss it. Summer? Anyone else have any other questions? We'll take another one. We'll take another one. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you all very much. All right. We'll catch up. <laughs>